Uh, let me ask you about, you mentioned the Israel lobby. You wrote a book, probably your most controversial book on the topic. Not probably. <laughs> Clearly the most controversial book I ever wrote. So you've uh, criticized the Israel lobby in the United States for influencing U.S. policy um, in the Middle East. Can you explain what the Israel lobby is, their influence, and your criticism over the past, let's say, a couple decades? Well, the argument that Steve Walt and I made, actually we wrote an article first, and uh, which appeared in the London Review of Books, uh, and then uh, we wrote the book itself. Uh, our, our argument is that the lobby is a loose coalition of uh, individuals and organizations uh, that push American policy in a pro-Israel direction. Uh, and uh, basically the lobby is interested in getting Israel, excuse me, getting the United States, and here we're talking mainly about the American government, to support Israel no matter what Israel does. And our argument is that if you look at the relationship between the United States and Israel, it's unprecedented in modern history. Uh, this is the closest relationship that you can find between any two countries in recorded history. It's truly amazing the extent to which Israel and the United States are joined at the hip. And we support Israel no matter what, almost all the time. Uh, and uh, our argument is that that is largely due to the influence of the lobby. The lobby is uh, uh, an extremely powerful interest group. Now, it's very important to understand that the American political system is set up in ways that allow interest groups of all sorts to wield great influence. So in the United States, you have an interest group or a lobby like the National Rifle Association that makes it well nigh impossible to get gun control, yeah. right? Uh, and so with the Israel lobby, you have this group of individuals and organizations that wield enormous influence on U.S. policy toward the Middle East. And this is not surprising given the nature of the American political system. Uh, so our argument is that the lobby is not doing anything that's illegal or illicit or immoral or unethical. It's just a good old fashioned American interest group. And it just happens to be extremely powerful. And our argument is that this is not good for the United States because no two countries have the same interests all the time. And when our interests conflict with Israel's interests, we should be able to do what we think is in our national interest, in America's national interest. But the lobby tends to conflate America's national interest with Israel's national interest and wants the United States to support Israel no matter what. We also argue, and I cannot emphasize this enough given what's going on in the world today, that the lobby's effects, the lobby has not been pushing policies that are in Israel's interest. So our argument is that the lobby, right, the lobby pushes policies that are not in America's interest or not in Israel's interest. Now you're saying to yourself, what exactly does he mean by that? What every president since Jimmy Carter has tried to do, as I said before, is to foster a two-state solution, to push Israel, which is the dominant player in greater Israel, push Israel to accept the two-state solution. And we have run into huge resistance from the lobby whenever we tried to, let's be blunt about it, coerce Israel, right? In a perfect world where there was no lobby and an American president was free to put pressure on Israel, to coerce Israel, I believe we would have gone a long way towards getting two-state solution. And I believe this would have been in Israel's interest. Uh, but we couldn't get a two-state solution because it was almost impossible to put meaningful pressure on Israel because of the lobby. 
So this was not in Israel's interest, and it was not in America's interest. And that was the argument that we made. And uh, we, of course, got huge pushback for making that argument. What's the underlying motivation of the lobby? Is it religious in nature? Is it um, similar to the way war hawks are sort of militaristic in nature? Is it nationalistic in nature? What, what's, uh, if you were to de describe this loose coalition of people, what, what would you say is their motivation? Well, first of all, I think you have to distinguish between Jews and Christians. You want to remember that there are a huge number of Christian Zionists who are deeply committed to Israel no matter what, right? And then there are a large number of Jews. The Jews are obviously the most important of those two groups in the Israel lobby. But, you know, one of the arguments that we made in the book is that you should not call it the Jewish lobby because it's not populated just by Jews, and Christian Zionists are an important part of that lobby. But furthermore, there are a good number of Jews who are opposed to the lobby uh, and the policies that the lobby purveys, and there are uh, a number of Jews who are prominent anti-Zionists, right? So, and they're obviously not in the lobby. Or if you take a group like Jewish Voice for Peace, right? Jewish Voice for Peace is not in the lobby. So it's wrong to call it a Jewish lobby. But with regard to the American Jews who are in that lobby, uh, I think that really this is all about nationalism. It's not so much religion. Many of those Jews who are influential in the lobby are not religious in any meaningful sense of that term, but they self-identify as Jewish in, in, in the sense that they feel they're part of a Jewish nation and that the, in addition to being an American, right, they are part of this tribe, this nation called Jews and that they have a responsibility um, to push the United States in ways that support uh, the Jewish state. So I, I think that's what drives most, if not almost, all the Jews. This is not to say there's not a religious dimension for some of them, but I think that the, the main connection is much more tribal in nature. So I had a conversation with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and he said, fundamentally, if you're anti-Zionist, you're anti-Semitic. So the, the, the Zionist project is tied at the hip to the Jewish project. What, what do you have to say to that? Look, you can define anti-Semitism any way you want, right? And you can define anti-Semitism to incorporate anti-Zionism. Uh, and uh, I think we have reached the point where anti-Semitism is identified today, not just with anti-Zionism, but with criticism of Israel. If you criticize Israel, people will say, some people will say, you're an anti-Semite. And if that's your definition of anti-Semitism, it's taken an important term and stretched it to the point where it's meaningless, right? So when Steve and I wrote the book, uh, wrote the article and then wrote the book, all sorts of people said that we were anti-Semites. This is a ludicrous charge, but <laughs> what they meant was you're criticizing the lobby, you're criticizing Israel, and therefore you're an anti-Semite. Okay, if that's what an anti-Semite is, somebody who criticizes Israel, you know, probably half the Jewish community, if not more in the United States, is anti-Semitic. And of course, you get into all these crazy games where people are calling Jews, self-hating Jews, and anti-Semites because they're critical of Israel. But even people who are anti-Zionist, I don't think they're anti-Semitic at all. Uh, you can argue they're misguided, that's fine, but uh, many of these people are Jewish and proud of the fact that they're Jewish. They just don't believe that nationalism and Jewish nationalism is a force that should be applauded. And you want to understand that in the American context, there is a rich tradition of anti-Zionism, right? And, and these were not people who were anti-Semites, if you go back to the 30s, 40s, 50s. And the same thing was even true in Europe. There were all sorts of European Jews who were opposed to Zionism. 
Were they anti-Semites? I don't think so. But we've gotten to the point now where people are so interested in stopping any criticism of Israel that they wield this weapon of uh, calling people anti-Semites so uh, loosely that uh, the term has kind of lost meaning. So I I think Netanyahu is is wrong-headed to equate uh, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. Alan Dershowitz was one of the people that called you specifically anti-Semitic. Uh, so just looking at the space of discourse, how do you, wh- where's the slither of hope for healthy discourse about U.S. relationships with Israel uh, between you and Alan Dershowitz and others like him? Well, I think until there is a settlement of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there's no hope of putting an end to this nonsense, right? So these are just uses of terms to kind of cheat your way through the through the discourse. No, it's shortcut. No, your... it's the silence people. Right. Silence. It's very very important to understand that one of the lobby's principal goals is to make sure we don't have an open discourse a freewheeling discourse about Israel because they understand, people in the lobby understand that if you have an open discourse, Israel will end up looking very bad, right? You don't want to talk about the occupation. You don't want to talk about how Israel was created, right? All all these subjects uh, are ones that uh, uh, will cause problems for Israel. See, just to go to the present crisis, okay? When you have a disaster, and what happened on October 7th is a disaster, one of the first things that happens is that people begin to ask the question, how did this happen, right? What's the root cause of this problem? This is a disaster. We have to understand what caused it so that we can work to uh, to make sure it doesn't happen again. So we can work to shut it down and then make sure it doesn't happen again. Mm-hmm. But once you start talking about the root causes, right, you end up talking about how Israel was created, right? And that means telling a story that is not pretty about how the Zionists conquered Palestine. Uh, and number two, it means talking about the occupation. Right. It's not like uh, Hamas attacked on October 7th because there were just a bunch of anti Semites who hated Jews and wanted to kill Jews. This is not, you know, Nazi Germany, right? This is directly related to the occupation and to what was going on inside of Gaza. And it's not in Israel's interest or the lobby's interest to have an open discourse about what the Israelis have been doing to the Palestinians since, I would say, roughly 1903 when the second Aliyah came to Israel uh, or came to what was then Palestine, right? You want to talk about that. And we don't want to talk about, from the lobby's point of view, the influence that the lobby has, Right. Uh, it's better from the lobby's point of view if most Americans think that uh, American support of Israel is just done for all the right moral and strategic reasons, not because of the lobby. And when John Mearsheimer and Steve Walt come along and say, you have to understand that this special relationship is due in large part to the lobby's influence, that is not an argument that uh, people in the lobby want to hear. So the point is you have to go to great lengths for all these reasons. You have to go to great lengths to silence people like me and Steve Walt. And one of the ways to do that is to call us anti-Semites. I think the chapter or the section of the book where we talk about this charge of anti-Semitism is called the great silencer. That's what we call the charge of anti-Semitism, the great silencer. Who wants to be called an anti-Semite, especially in the wake of the Holocaust? Do I want to be called an anti-Semite? Oh, my God, no. Uh, and uh, so it's very effective. But, you know, it is important to talk about these issues, in my humble opinion. And I think if we had talked about these issues uh, way back when, uh, it would have gone a long way towards, uh, you know, 
maybe getting a two-state solution, which I think was the best alternative here. It, it's complicated, and I wonder if you can comment on the complexity of this, because criticizing Israel and you know criticizing the lobby can, um, for a lot of people, be a dog whistle for sort of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that, you know, this idea that Jews run everything, run the world, or this kind of cabal. And, you know, it's it's also very true that people who are legitimately anti-Semitic are also critics of Israel in the same kind of way. And so it's such a complicated landscape in which to have discussions because, um, uh, you know, even people like David Duke uh, who are you know racist d don't sound racist on the surface. Well, I haven't listened to him enough, but like it, you know, there's dog whistles. It's it's a complicated space in which to have discussions because it. Um, I mean, I wonder if you can sort of speak to that um, because there's this silencing effect of calling everybody anti-Semitic, but it's also true that there is anti-Semitism in the world. Like, there is a sizable population of people that hate Jews. There's probably a sizable population of people who hate Muslims, too. But, you know, I- <laughs> A lot of hate out there. A lot of hate out there. Uh, but uh, the hatred of Jews has like a long history. And so you have like, you know, Rolling Stones have a, a set of great hits. And there's just a set of great hits of the ways, conspiracy theories that you can make up about the Jews that are used as part of the hatred. Uh, so there's like nice templates for that. And I, I just wonder if you can comment on operating as a historian, as an analyst, as a strategic thinker in this kind of space. Yeah, we obviously, when we wrote the article, which we did before the book, gave the subject a great deal of thought. I mean, uh, what you say just now is music to our ears. I'm talking for me and st about me and Steve. Uh, I mean, I think that, you know, your point about dog whistles is correct. Look, we went to great lengths to make it clear that this is not a cabal. It's not a conspiracy. And in fact, in a very important way, the lobby operates out in the open, right? Uh, they brag about their power, right? And, and this was true before we wrote the article, Right, and uh, and we said in the article and the book, and you heard me say it here. First of all, it's not a Jewish lobby, right? Uh, secondly, it's not a cabal, right? It's an American interest group, and and the American system is designed such that interest groups are perfectly legal, and some of them are super effective. Exactly. I mean, you yeah. hit the nail right on the head. That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, and, and there was nothing that we said that was anti-Semitic by any reasonable definition of that term. And, you know, huge numbers of Jews have known me and Steve over the years, and nobody ever, ever said that we were anti-Semitic before March 2006 when the article appeared, because we're not anti-Semitic. But look, you've got this interest group, right, that has a significant influence on American policy and on Israeli policy, and you want to talk about it. It's just important to talk about it. It's important for Jews right, in the United States, for Jews in Israel, to talk about this. The idea that you, you want to silence critics is not a smart way to go about doing business, in my opinion. If we were wrong, if Steve and I were so wrong and our arguments were so foul, they could have easily exposed those arguments. They could have gone uh, into combat with this in terms of the marketplace of ideas and easily knocked us down. The problem was that our arguments were quite powerful. And instead of engaging us and defeating our arguments, they wanted to silence us. And this is not good 
right? It's not good for Israel. It's not good for the United States. And I would argue in the end, if anything, it's going to foster anti-Semitism. I think you don't want to run around telling people that they can't talk about Israel without being called an anti-Semite. It's just not, it's not healthy uh, in terms of the issue that you're raising, right? But I still agree with you that it is a tricky issue. It's, I, I don't want to make light of that. You know, I, I know that there's this piece of literature out there called The Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And I fully understand that if you're not careful, you can come close to writing volume two of The Protocol. But I don't believe that we wrote anything that was even close to that. And again, I think that a healthy debate on the issues that we were raising would have been in, not only in America's interest, but it would have been in Israel's interest. 